I am Franny Ness and I live in Hyde Park and I have been have had the great privilege of being a friend of Lisa Fitkos for about the last 10 12 years of her life. I'm also one of the founders of the Lisa Fitko Internship Committee which was started to preserve her memory and to continue it in terms of training young people to do some of the kind of social justice work that she was interested in and did much of her life. I met Lisa when she was quite old, but you didn't really think of her as being old. She was very lively, alert, interested in things, asked a lot of questions, and had a lot of opinions. She was a very firm person. She knew what she liked and didn't like, and she had strong opinions on most everything. Lisa's life is long and complicated, and I'll try to give a little summary of it, but it'll always be inadequate because there's always so much more that could have been said. So she was born in 1909 in the Hungro-Austrian Empire. The part she was born in was Hungary, or would be Hungary today. And very soon the family moved to Budapest, where they spent the First World War, which was hard because there were a lot of food shortages but they were not really in the war as such. Afterwards, they moved to Vienna, and there it was that she met anti-Semitism, perhaps a little in Hungary too, and she couldn't understand it. She was a child, and she didn't understand why being Jewish was a bad thing. Freilich wandeln Sie Ihr Äußeres, wenn Sie von der polnischen Niststätte in die reiche Welt hinausgelangen. Pais und Bar, Kappe und Kaftan kennzeichnen den Ostjuden für jedermann. Legt er sie ab, so erkennen nur schärfer blickende Menschen seine Rasse. After the war, the father moved the family to Berlin. He was a leftist writer and had a lot of contacts with interesting people of the time, avant-garde artists and writers. And Lisa met many of these people at the Eckstein apartment in Berlin. She went to school at the gymnasium, which at the time had almost no girls. She was the only girl in her class and she admitted that she rather liked that. She also very early got involved with leftist organizations in Berlin and took part in demonstrations and was very aware of the rise of Hitler and his cohorts. Became much more active, especially after 1933, when Hitler officially took power. She participated in demonstrations and she always narrated a specific incident where she was typing some dangerous literature and in order to mask the noise of the typewriter, she had a record of Aida play over and over. She was being threatened with imprisonment and some of her friends or cohorts in the various organizations she worked with had already disappeared. And so she left for Czechoslovakia. In Prague, she met Hans Fitko, who had been a communist organizer in Berlin and a writer 
he was basically a journalist. And they immediately took to each other and continued their journey together. First to Basel, Switzerland, where they got permission to stay and stayed for almost a year when the, the government in Basel received an order from Germany to deliver Hans Fitko because he had supposedly murdered someone before he left. This was, of course, a totally trumped up charge, but the Swiss would have to reply to it, and so they warned the Fitkos, and the Fitkos left in the middle of the night for France. From France, they went to Holland, and then eventually back to Paris. All the while, while in Switzerland, Holland, France, they would write anti-Nazi pamphlets, print them, and bring them to the border to people they were in contact with who would then distribute them in Germany. So their activism never stopped. In Paris, they were reunited with Lisa's parents and brother and his wife. And then not too long afterwards, the Germans marched in the north of France and the situation became very precarious because the French considered all German citizens enemies and didn't differentiate between the Nazi sympathizers or the Germans who had fled from the Nazis and tried to find refuge in France. They opened up camps, internment camps, and transported as many of these Germans to those camps, and there were women camps and men camps, and mostly in the south of France. Lisa was sent to Gurs and Hans to Vermouche. They had no contact with each other. Nobody had any contact from those camps. But some of the interns became somewhat friendly with staff and some of the staff had very mixed feelings about these interns, especially about the Jewish refugees. And they would give them information when they could and the information would be disseminated mouth, word by mouth. Some of the women stole forms, release forms from the camp and then forged the commander's signature. And, and then they started to recruit people in the camp and say, you know, come and leave with us. We can leave, we have papers. I think we can make it. And many people were afraid because they didn't speak French, they didn't have any money. How were they going to survive outside the camp? But about 60 of them took advantage of this opportunity. Among them, of course, were Lisa and her good friend, Paulette. And also among them was Hannah Arendt, who Lisa had known already earlier. So they got these forms, they managed to leave the camp, and they tried to find their way to Marseille, from where everybody was gathering and hoping to leave from. By various accidents and, I mean, amazing happenings. People tried to communicate with each other with little slips of paper. They wrote down names of who was where and who was looking for whom. And every time they met someone else, they brought out their notes and went over them and people were reunited. Thus, um, Lisa found out that Hans was also on the way to Marseille by bicycle and at some point he joined her and Paulette and a couple of other people they had met and joined up with on the way. They all came to Marseille where there was total chaos and hundreds and hundreds of people were looking for papers and documents and ways to escape. Lisa went to a small town on the Riviera on, um, in, in France near the Spanish border 
looking for a way to get people into Spain that was not going through official checkpoints. With the help of the socialist mayor, she found or heard about a path. He gave her a little sketch. And before she had any time to organize herself or explore the route personally, she was sent three people from Marseille with a note from her husband that uh, she needed to help them. And uh, among them was Walter Benjamin, a German philosopher and writer whom she had known in Berlin. She went back to Marseille and was recruited with her husband by the American Rescue Committee, who had heard about her exploration of this path. They um, agreed to spend whatever time there was before Germany actually made it all the way south to take people across that pass that were being sent to them by the American Rescue Committee. So they went to Banyul, they got a small apartment, and for the next six to seven months, they regularly took small groups of people across the pass. They left in the late afternoon hours and pretended to be vineyard workers. They didn't keep any count, but they think that they probably took around 100 people across in that uh, time span. Then they returned to Marseille and the general confusion there they had been promised that the American Rescue Committee would get them exit permits. And after a while, this actually happened, and they were told that they were going to go to Cuba. They didn't know where Cuba was. After getting that information, they went to a bookstore, took down an atlas, and looked at this island So they got all the necessary papers together, which was an exit permit from France, an entry permit from Spain, a passage permit to Portugal, a ship's ticket on some boat, and an entry permit from Cuba. And unless you had all that together, plus some money to pay a fee at the customs, when you went into Spain, you couldn't leave. The American Rescue Committee got it together for them. And they uh, traveled to Spain and to Portugal. Of course, on the way, they couldn't resist to do some additional work. And they took along with them some top secret documents hidden in tubes of toothpaste and shaving cream that they had to deliver to a Spanish member of the Republican army that had lost against Franco. And they had to deliver it in Portugal. They did this, they were not caught, and they delivered the tubes to their man in Portugal and went on a small ship, the SS Colonial, a pretty rickety, 
shift where they were at the bottom in a space that was usually used for luggage because but because these refugees were not allowed to have luggage they could use the space to cram in In Cuba, they were sh shortly taken to a camp, an internment camp, and they were registered and questioned and then uh, let go. And uh, eventually, they found jobs. Lisa worked as a secretary. She learned Spanish very quickly and learned it very well. And uh, Hans became a diamond cutter. Not anything that was in his past, but he learned to trade and was able to make a living. Throughout the world, throngs of people hail the end of the war in Europe. It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. And when the war ended, they were very eager to get out and return to Germany and help rebuild a truly democratic state. However, because of their past activities in Berlin, with Hans having been a communist and Lisa a socialist, the United States, which was one of the occupying armies, occupying governments of uh, Germany did not let them return because they did not, it was at the time of the great fear of communism and they did not want them to be there. They were, however, willing to let them come to the United States. So three years later in 48, they came to the United States and they came to Chicago because Lisa's brother had settled here and had a family, wife, and two children by that time. And it was not just in Chicago, but actually in Hyde Park, where they settled down. I'm now entering East View Park, where Lisa Fitko spent the last part of her life. I was very close here and was able to visit her many evenings since both of us were late night, late night people. And we would talk about plays I had seen, concerts I had heard, we would talk politics, about recent books, mostly political, and drink a lot of tea and eat a lot of pastries. So she lived on the first floor in the, the windows on the left here. So she could actually see the lake and uh, of course look out on this nice green area. Here is a bench that she sat on many times, especially in her later years. This is the entrance to Lisa's apartment in this complex of apartments on the south side of Chicago. Lisa stayed here and worked and helped look after her parents, who also had ended up here. Hans had health problems, and I don't know exactly what they were, but he died in 1960. Once she was retired, she finally had time and wrote her memoirs. And her first book, The Escape Across the Pyrenees, was quite a success. She kept active. She was politically 
involved in many organizations in Chicago, in Hyde Park especially, and had a very long life, quite satisfying, and she has got visitors from all over the world, and among them many young people, and she always enjoyed talking to and discussing with young people, and died at 95, and had a very exciting and life, a life that we would like to remember because it showed such a positive side of human beings, of the way they can help each other and be very selfless and not something she would ever point out. She was very modest about her achievements and said, um, that's just what had to be done. And that's how we all should feel. <laughs>